This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. You know, we say we're so proud and thrilled by the democracy placed in our hands, and we think of it as a model for the world. So then why, when we're called upon to vote on Election Day, do so many of us not do it? Victoria Bassetti studied the country's tortured history of voting, and it is a long history and tortured, and the many issues surrounding the elections before writing an amazing book called Electoral Dysfunction, a survival manual for American voters. And she's my guest today. And American voters really do need survival. <laughs> they do. Advice, yeah. <laughs> and you, you sometimes, you, the way the system treats us, you'd think they really don't want us to vote. Yeah. It's well, isn't that true sometimes? <laughs> it actually is true sometimes, <laughs> yeah. So you start your book by saying, surprisingly, we don't have the right to vote. Uh, basically in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. Yeah, it's uh, one of those startling facts that uh, I, I've gotten into arguments with my law school friends about this. <laughs> you know, we all studied constitutional law and then we get into arguments and they're just dumbfounded that I would say there's no right to vote in the Constitution. And then eventually we end up, you know, pulling out a copy of the Constitution and I challenge them to find a, the right to vote in the Constitution and it's not there. Um, it's, uh, it, it sort of is uh, something kind of like it, an implied right to vote has worked right. its way into the Constitution the over, over time through the yeah. amendments. But as originally drafted in 1787, no right to vote in the well, Constitution. you explain in a very interesting way that in a way there were members who were writing that Constitution who were actually suppressing a universal vote, right? Well, sure. I mean, yeah. it, it, they, they were... Explain to us how this happened. So it was, a, it was a number of reasons why there's no right to vote in the Constitution. Um, the first is that there was a, uh, a, a genuine concern about universal suffrage. There was quite a bit of doubt amongst the founders uh, uh, about the kind of mass, masses of no, propertyless, illiterate people uh, democracy run amok. So they weren't entirely behind the idea of everyone being able to vote. Uh, at the time, pretty much only white propertied men could vote. There were a few exceptions. You know, Massachusetts, yeah. blacks could vote. In New Jersey, some women, some women could vote. Uh, and that's another reason why there was no right to vote written in the Constitution, right. because how were they going to get all the states to agree? They all had different rules mm -hmm. already. Were you going to tell uh, you know, South Carolina blacks had to vote, or in the alternative, were you going to tell Massachusetts blacks couldn't vote? Yeah. Uh, so they, they. So it was a grand compromise of it, trying to adopt the Constitution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it wasn't the kind of grand compromise that's uh, written out the way, like the Connecticut mm -hmm. Compromise is, mm -hmm. or the Three Fifths Compromise was. You don't kind of see it as clearly as you see some of those other compromises in the Constitution. But they just sort of decided, you know what? Let's let the states run their elections the way they run their elections. And the other thing is at the time when the Constitution was drafted, there was only one office that was subject to direct popular vote. That's right. And that was representatives. The president wasn't elected popularly. He was elected by, and it was would have been a he, of course. Uh, he was elected by electors. Right. And senators were selected by their state legislatures. So there was really only one federal election to worry <coughs> about. Me. But they did divide it up, didn't they? I mean, the House mm -hmm. represented to a degree, the population, or did it represent? Yeah, it was directly proportional. The entire population. population, including women. Yes, and and, and slaves. And slaves. Three fifths, or yeah. as they were counted, right. at least three fifths. So they counted yeah. in the representation part, but they couldn't vote. For exactly. Them. Yeah. And the Senate was still two people from each state. Right. Exactly, and that's the Connecticut Compromise. And, and in fact, that's the way the Electoral right. College is built. Those are the building blocks of the Electoral College that elects the president. So. Yeah. The, do you think the major problem was that they decided to leave it to the states? Yeah, I think that that's yeah, basically... We'll come back to that at the end of our conversation, right? Exactly. And so in the intervening years since 1787, you know, at this stage in our history, right, in the yeah. early 21st century, yeah. we've got a civil war, uh, civil rights movement, women's, uh, you know, movement... Suffrage. Uh, yeah. Suffrage. Eight, eight uh, amendments to the Constitution dealing with voting. 
um, the youth quake of the 1970s, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, most people in America are, feel like, oh, of course I've got a right to vote. But they don't. Uh, now, we've got an implied right, you know, so yeah. it's, it's not like anyone's going to get rid of democracy or right. call off elections or anything like that, but it does lead to this kind of kludgy patchwork quilt all over. all over the place. Supreme Court law is a little scattershot. You know, how well your vote is protected really turns more on whether or not your state has a right to vote in its constitution than whether or not the federal government does. Do you does. happen to know how many states have that right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know off the top of my yeah. head. It's, it is a majority. <coughs> Um, but uh, even even then, it doesn't necessarily... And, it, and yeah. depending when it happened, too. Depending okay. when it yeah. happened, and depending what that state's particular law is right. on how they interpret Do you their think right that to vote. each time the electorate was enlarged, was it done in response to demands from the populace? Yes, yeah, sometimes, not always. Interestingly enough, probably the, the, uh, the uh, diminution or the sub elimination of property requirements was not as a result of demands, although although there were actual fights about it. There was a almost a revolt in Rhode Island in the, I think it's in the early 19th century, where working men literally rioted in the street and took over the state capitol in Rhode Island demanding the vote. Uh, that was a very <laughs> rare exception. By and large, the franchise was expanded on, on a property basis, uh, kind of without demand. But when it came to obviously African Americans, blacks, mm -hmm. um, and women, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of it, there was a lot of screaming and yeah, yelling. Yeah. There was a lot of bloodshed too. So, so the electoral college we know today comes out of that, huh? Yeah. So, so the 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 electoral <laughs> let's, college. Let's explain the electoral college. Sure. So <laughs> when you vote for president, you are not voting for president. You're voting for someone else to vote for president. Uh, Do we even know who we're voting for? It depends. In some states, the electors actually are still on the ballot. Um, if you happened, however, to vote in New York today, uh, we're, we're filming on, yeah. on election day, if you voted in New York today, uh, it would have said electors for president. It would have said you're voting for electors, uh -huh. but then when you filled in the little oval, all it said was Barack Obama or Mitt Romney or, um, you know. Yeah. And, and the, but the electors, yeah. the rule about, or the law about electors, that's national. Yes. It's all the same. Right. So going back to the kind of founding fathers concern about, you know, representation and democracy run amok, mm -hmm. uh, when, when, they, when they were thinking about how are we going to select a president, they were really confused about it. In fact, it's probably nothing hung the Constitutional Convention up longer than how they were going to pick a president and what the president's powers were going to be. I joke about it in the book that if the vote had turned out differently, we would have had a three person presidency uh, selected by a committee of Congress, each of them uh, serving office for six years and no more. Um, it, it didn't turn out that way. They, they ultimately got around to having one person be president, elected for four-year terms. Uh, but the way the president was selected was through the Electoral College. The, the mm -hmm. Founding Fathers were concerned about a mass popular vote. Um, they rejected it every time it was proposed. Um, and Part of the reason they were concerned about it was because they, not so much that they didn't trust the people, as they were just kind of uncertain that the people could select the right person given the difficulty of travel and national reputation in the country. And so what they were worried would happen is a bunch of regional favorites would be selected and, okay. and we would devolve into kind of state sectionalism and fighting amongst the states for who would be president. So what they wanted was a kind of a group of wise men. Of course, it would have been men. Mm -hmm. um, so they wanted a group of wise men who would select the best person for the job, not necessarily the regional favorite. And when you take a look at the way the Electoral College was originally written, it clearly reflects that. When electors, as originally written, cast their ballot for president, they cast two votes for president. One of them had to be not from their state. So the way the Constitution was drafted, they were clearly trying to get, kind of break apart right. sectionalism right. and regionalism right. and create one unified president. So how does the Electoral College work today? So it works the same way today pretty right. much as it did and in 17. And each state has a different number or the same number? Each state has a different number of electors. Based on? Uh, first population. So you take a look at how many um, representatives mm -hmm. you have. Oh. They're allocated on the basis of population. So if you've got 10 representatives in your state, you've got 
10 electoral college yeah, votes. That's interesting. So you don't need to go to the basic figure of population, you just no. go to the representation. Go to the representation, and then you add two for each senator that you have. So it gives that little, you know, kind of thumb on the scale to the small states. But it so. never really got politics out of the process. Never, no. Especially when we see the redistricting and the closeness of politics, right? Exactly. So we've got five, 538 electors. Uh -huh. um, that's been the number since around 1964. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, uh, today, f uh, 48 out of 50 states, 51 if you mm -hmm. count um, mm -hmm. the uh, District of Columbia, so uh, 49 <laughs> out of 51 states. Um, but the District of Columbia doesn't have an elector. It does. Oh, it does. Yeah, there, so the Constitution was amended to give the District of Columbia electors. Oh, so they've got, they have three electors. That's electors. why we've got 538. Yeah. Um, so if we had, if, if we didn't have DC, yeah. we'd five, 535. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it, yeah, you really do need a, yeah. an Excel spreadsheet to keep track of all this. Um, so, um, so at each state allocates its electors to who today you know, on a winner-take-all basis. So every state does that. Uh, uh, every state but two. So if you if you're a presidential candidate and you win that state's popular vote by just one vote you get all of its electoral college votes. Uh, which of the two states that uh, don't? Nebraska and uh, okay. Uh, I'm matter. having a brain freeze right We'll read the right book. Now. We'll find yeah. it out. We'll exactly. Look at it's it. in there. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. It's, even that isn't that democratic, is it? No, no, no. It's. I mean, it's not at all. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, four times in yeah. American history, that we've had a, we've had someone who lost yeah. the popular vote right. win the electoral college vote. Just recently. The most recent time was yeah. in 2000. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Now, how do the the elector the electors how do they get a Appointed or elected? So it varies on a state by state basis. Again, the Constitution is remarkably generous to the states. The way the Constitution is written, the electors can be selected however the state wants. If uh, if this if the governor of your state wanted to pick the electors out of the phone book, that could that's it could be that. If you wanted to hold a basketball tournament or you know a ping pong tournament Thank and whoever wins the ping pong tournament gets to be the elector that could be it now, that's not going to happen no one's going to do right. anything that silly right. right and just every one, yeah. it's just once or twice that somebody's voted against the state um, so that that's the the so-called faithless yeah. elector so let me let me finish how oh, I'm sorry. So, yeah, yeah so please. today the way electors are selected originally they were selected usually by the state um, senate or mm -hmm. or you know house of representatives or or, or that uh, nowadays they are usually selected by uh, the local state democratic or republican party um, so they're kind of party activists um, and yeah and so but the the irony is is that in most states, whoever is the elector is not actually legally obliged to vote for whoever won that, that state's state. popular vote. That's the so-called faithless elector. So it's someone who could be an elector they, who... They get a cro yeah, they, an they, X on their back or something. That's right, but nothing happens to them. In fact, this year, <laughs> yeah. three, Rom three potential Romney electors have said that they won't vote for him. Oh, so, that's so interesting. Yeah, because they're, they were, they're Ron Paul people. And they've said that they would vote for Ron Paul instead. Now, if push comes to shove, I, I don't know what's really going to happen yeah. with those guys. Yeah. But they've, you That's know, made they a say. they've made a public statement, and yeah. it's uh, these. There have been many faithless electors in American history. Um, it's never had an impact. It's never made a difference on who yeah. won the presidency. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be sort of interesting to see if, if it, like, did. <laughs> what, what would happen if it happened this yeah. year. I, 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 uh, it, it's it's a kind of perverse to want that to happen because it would be interesting, but we really shouldn't want something so, like that to happen. So the reason that the Constitution didn't make elections, the electoral system, a federal system, is now why we see all of this stuff. That's why we see thirteen thousand election districts throughout the United States. And just different, different just ballot designs, different machines that they use. Uh, usually, uniform polling hours across the state. But, uh, you know, that's why you can have Miami all of a sudden on an ad hoc basis decide that they're going to expand early voting hours and keep the doors open a little bit longer. But just across the county border, you know, they shut it down. Um, so, And yeah. is there a direct relationship to the majority party in a state as to what happens 
in the legislature there seems to be in the recent years. So yeah, most most election administration is partisan. Um, it's uh, not not every. There are a few states where they've mm -hmm. really done a really great job of getting a little bit of the partisanship. Do they get out. elected? They don't get elected, then they get appointed. Uh, they get appointed usually, um, or they do get elected, but it's a bipartisan board. I see. And and when they get elected, they get elected for kind of long and staggered terms. Right. So it's so sort it's of always moving. Yeah. It's always moving, and there's a you know, and there's a kind of a sense of professionalism. It's almost like this is the job that I want. It's not a stepping stone to a future job. Whereas in a lot of other states, it's the Secretary of State who runs the election administration system, usually elected, usually partisan. Or sometimes it's the Secretary of State who is appointed by the governor. Um, and so OE owes a lot to this, mm -hmm. you know, to the party apparatus within that state. And then you usually have county or local election boards, and those are partisan too. Um, and and you know, there's just no question but that it has an impact on, on outcomes. And the way you can vote is different too. A state doesn't have one system of voting. It can change all over, it can, all different. It can vary on a city, by, it can vary on a precinct by right. precinct basis. You could literally cross the line and go from a scanner to a, you know, a, a touch mm -hmm. screen, screen voting machine or, or whatever. So yeah. <laughs> why don't, the, w let's start with the process. It starts with registration. Yeah. There, there are a couple of states where registration is very easy. There's no registration in North Dakota. You yeah. just walk in. Just walk in and vote. <laughs> walk in and vote. Um, and uh, there are a bunch of other states where they've got it online. Um, Phoenix, Arizona has done an amazing job of creating an online voter registration system. Um, there are a bunch of other states where you can register on Election Day. Um, so North mm. Dakota, you don't even have to register, mm. right? In, in uh, the New other Hampshire, places you can go to vote and you just register. Maine, you just walk in on election day, and you say, "Here's, you know, I'm, I'm Victoria Bassetti," and they look you up. You know, you're not here. Well, okay, I'll register then, yeah. and, they're, and they let you do and it. And they let you do it. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it's it's that's uh, by the way, the way they do it in Canada is really they do, it, the government does it. Yeah, they what they do is they take a look at. Um, at all their records, and you know, they take school records, um, healthcare records, tax tax returns, so on and so forth. Home ownership or whatever. Home, yeah, yeah, anything that's in the record, yeah. the, right. you know, selective service, if, right. uh, you know, uh, whatever the databases of names that they have, and they cross check all of them, they vet them, and then they create a master list of eligible voters. And they've got about 92% of all of their eligible voters on a list in Canada. And they're all registered yeah. for, the, for you. In the U.S., we're lucky if we hit 77 or 70. We're, uh, we're like 130. Our voting yeah. popul it's what is it, the eligible number of eligible voters? Who vote is we're in the. Uh, in way down near the end of the list, 137 or yeah. something. Yeah, we're keeping company right. with some. Countries Terrible don't want countries. to be coming, coming and Mexico coming. also has done a, an effort to register. Yeah, so Mexico is a blended system in contrast to Canada. So in, in Canada, if you're, you know they've got ninety two percent of the names on there, yeah. and if on election day you walk in and you're not on that list, yeah. they let you register. In Mexico, uh, in the mid nineties, they really messed. You know, there were a lot of bad elections <laughs> in Mexico, and um, so they just decided they were like, okay, we're done with this, and they just scrapped their system and decided to build a whole modern one from the ground up. So they did that, this comprehensive national effort to find every eligible right. voter. Then after that was done, they said, okay, if you're not on the list from here on out, you, you're going to have to walk right. in and register yourself. Right. But they've got this really amazing permanent effort. They send buses out into neighborhoods. This is the government that right. does it. It's structure and, and encouragement. Yeah, four years ago, they gave out gift bags to, uh, to young voters to encourage them to register to vote. <laughs> you know, I, I love the story in the book, yeah. and you know the book is very entertaining. And in addition to being very, inst very instructive, but the story about the ex premier in hung Hungary, yeah, yeah, who went on a hunger strike outside the parliament. Why? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> this is this summer the uh, the former well, the, yeah, summer. The, the former prime minister of Hungary. So Hungary just recently decided to impose for a first of its kind in Europe a voter registration requirement. Hungary until this time was a lot like Canada. Yeah. You know, they created so. the lists and. And so the, in, in the, the, the prime minister of Hungary with three of his compatriots pitched a tent in front of the parliament building and went on a hunger strike over voter registration. <laughs> the idea that any American would, would get that upset about voter registration is, is just wouldn't happen. Yeah. Well, you know, being a New Yorker, it is, yeah. it's traumatic to go to the polls. I know. And not, you know, to think that your name might not be there. Then you have all these things. You've got 
you have to go to a judge, you have to do this, or yeah. you used to. I, now you, 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 you still do. You sign an affidavit. Why, yeah. why, why do we do this? You know, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I really don't know. I, it's it's just you know something about the American psyche that just it's so we're so worked up about this. And you know, look, there is a there is a real history of fraud and abuse and of elections in the United States. There is. Yeah, absolutely. You mean I mean, serious? Uh, yeah, in the nineteenth century. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> you know, in the days in Boston. Yeah. And, yeah. Exactly. And Tammany Hall and yeah, all. Yeah, and so it sort of kind of hangs over us, mm -hmm. um, and. <laughs> And we've never, it, it, you know, a more gets than, handed down family yeah. to generation. To gen no, it, it doesn't. Yeah, it really does. You know, it's so funny. If you if you if you go to Tammany Hall today, what yeah. the, the remains of Tammany right. Hall in New York City, they can't get you, it together to get inspectors. Well, you you can go down to Tammany Hall and in, in, uh, it's right on Union Square today, yeah. and there's a nail salon and a deli <laughs> and a film academy. You mean the wonderful building? Yeah, exa there. exactly. There's. You know, I was yeah. act, I've been active in politics all my life, and when I was young. And I first went to the first meeting ever in Tammany Hall. I thought it was going to be this wonderful Romanesque building or something, right? Instead, it was a suite of offices in Madison Avenue with false wall, uh, paper that looked like uh, wood. Yeah. And it and, was a and really and really bad shag carpeting. And nothing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, you know, there. It, um, it's funny. I, what one of the things that's in the book is this: uh, when Indiana passed a voter ID requirement mm -hmm. um, earlier in the 2000s. Um, it, uh, some people challenged it as unconstitutional, and they took it up to the Supreme Court. And so, in, in Marion versus, uh, I'm sorry. Um, so, it, 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 they, uh, so the Supreme Court takes a look at at the yeah. le at the legislation, yeah. and they say there has never been a documented instance of voter impersonation fraud in Indiana. But there was this Tammany Hall thing about a hundred years ago, so we're going to uphold this law, and and it's just. It tells you how much this this kind of heavy weight of the fraud right. that was That's rampant in the 19th century weighs on us, and so. That's interesting. You know, the the other thing about it is is that um, votes lead to power, right? So if, you know, that's the means to power. Right. So we shouldn't be too surprised that power is brought to bear on voting, and that our voting system is manipulated for the benefit of one or the other party that's in power. And that goes back to the partisanship in administering our election. You know, I think, I, I think, look, we've taken mm. partisanship out of monetary policy in the United States. We've got a Federal Reserve mm -hmm. Board, theoretically, that takes a little <laughs> bit of the politics out of voting, out of money right. in America. We, and I happen to think that voting is just as precious to our country as, as money is. Yep. And if we could take a little bit of the politics out of it and create kind of a Federal Reserve Board for voting, or, interesting. you know, we might be able to ratchet down a little bit of the yelling and screaming and noise and craziness about voting, bring a little rationality into the system, mm -hmm. and bring voters back in, yeah. you, know? you know? And it's getting, it, it seems to me it's even nastier now when we've got an increasing Hispanic Latino population. And of course, it's always been with African Americans yeah. and more political polarization. It's very mean spirited. Yeah, and that it, it, one of the interesting things is uh, allowing felons, ex felons, to vote. That's an enormous variation, isn't it, across it, the country? Yeah, it, and it's it's one of these uh, you know terrific, to my mind, tragedies about the way our our voting system operates. The book tells the story of a, a man in Mississippi, Terrence mm -hmm. Watts, who was a uh, convicted of a of a drug related crime, a nonviolent drug related crime, uh, five or six years ago, seven years ago served about a year and a half in prison, got out. He lives in a small town in Mississippi on the Blues Trail. Um, it's a really pretty town, by the way. Um, and uh, his local alderman in the, in the county election that was going on that year uh, tried to get him, recruited him to vote for him. And the alderman, on a you know, get out the vote drive, took him to the local city hall. This is Terrence Watts. Took Terrence Watts to the city hall and said, you know, get your absentee ballot. So Terrence Watts goes. Mm -hmm. He asks the city clerk for his absentee ballot. And the city clerk looks on the registration roll and says, yeah, you're on the registration roll. Here's your ballot. So Terrence Watts votes absentee. Well, now, as it turns out, in Mississippi, people who've got prior felony convictions are permanently barred for the, for the rest of their life from being able to vote. There's an exception if the governor pardons you or if the legislature mm. passes a bill specifically for you, mm. allowing you to vote again. And no surprise, Terrence Watts hadn't had either of those things mm. happen. So he was indisputably not eligible to vote. 
Um, and, but he did vote anyway. He cast an absentee ballot twice in a local county city election. So the local prosecutor, a Republican, and he, Terrence Watts voted in a predominantly Democratic city, uh, caught Terrence Watts, prosecuted him, and Terrence Watts pled guilty and is serving 10 years in prison for voting. He's, you know. It's so crazy. It's crazy. And, and, uh, it, Can we not get a, a legis the legislature to pass a bill? <laughs> there <laughs> there are a lot. Cause. Yeah, so, so, you know, look, I get it. He wasn't entitled to vote, right. you know, but 10 years in prison, and, right. you know, that's, the, he's not the only person where this has happened. There were prosecutions in Milwaukee, same thing happened. Uh, in Milwaukee, there was a woman who was prosecuted who had served her time. She was out on probation. As it happens in Wisconsin, you are allowed to vote after you've finished your finished probation. It. But she hadn't finished her probation, and she cast an absentee ballot. And then she realized, oh, wait a second, I'm not allowed to do it. She called up the Board of Elections and said, I voted by accident. They were like, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll see what we can do about it. Well, a few months later, they she caught her, it. prosecuted her, and put her in prison. Crazy. Yeah, and so, so you know. It, uh, but aside from those injustices, it's yeah. also so apparent that the major, the the major portion of the population, prison population in this country, is of color. Is of color. It's it's. Uh, and the other side of it is yeah. that the prison population is counted in the census, and that's how they get their representation. Exactly. There are there are nine hundred. There are more than nine hundred thousand people in the United States who are not eligible to vote. I, I don't remember the exact numbers. It's it's in the book. But a very very substantial portion of the African American male population in Florida is disenfranchised as a result. Yes, of Yes, it was role. an astonishing number. It, I remember it's that. Really staggering. So um, on your you have a website. Yes. <laughs> and it's called uh, what? Electoraldysfunction.org. And do we have things that we could do to try to make the system better? What are we going to do about this? Yeah, and you know, we, we forgot to mention that there's a companion documentary film. Oh, that's right, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that it's on been airing course. on PBS. Yeah. And uh, if it's no longer on, because uh, the run really right. was a little bit leading up to the election, it's available on iTunes and for DVD on and the website, called? Electoral Dysfunction. <laughs> and this book was designed as a companion piece to it. Exactly, But it yeah. stands on its own. Absolutely, it's a, it, it's a, it, it covers the same themes, but it's uh, it's, it's going to make you even more shocked than the viewers uh, yeah, yeah. will be and have been. And after they see the different yeah. complaints today, they'll most likely yeah. even be more shocked. Yeah. So we've really come to the end of this program. Thank you. Had a great and time. I thank you so much, Victoria. And uh, I hope you continue to struggle or strive to help us get a better way of electing. Our I, public officials. I, I mean, I love voting, so I hope yeah. people don't get discouraged by the, the, right. the sad tales. Because it's the greatest thing to go and vote. It's still, it, yeah, it's it's your moment, your yeah. your moment of power. It's yeah. the moment when you put your mark on history. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you again. Thank you. Is there any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore? Please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.